To help unlock the ancient mysteries of the labyrinth, the rediscovered field of sacred geometry provides some clues. Suddenly, our once limited understanding of labyrinths has taken a quantum leap. Because sacred geometry says that you take sort of undifferentiated energy and by forming it in certain patterns, you get material creation, you get things, you know, that you can see and touch and feel. So it, it organizes energy in a way that, that becomes useful to us. And the labyrinth does the same thing. It's always been an, amaz an amazement to me to go out into a park where there was nothing, to put a labyrinth there. People walk around on the same ground they were walking on before as a park, but now in a particular pattern, and, uh, and all kinds of wonderful things happen to them. And, and in both directions, and, and also happens to the Earth. It's organizing the energy that's available to all of us from ourselves and from the Earth in, in a way that it becomes useful to us. Another one of the very common experiences that people report walking the labyrinths is that they come out much more alive. And I started looking at the pattern that the people were creating when they were walking the labyrinth. And those patterns turn out to be the, and, and the, pattern, the same patterns that are in nature that allows life to do everything that it does to create and sustain and support life. And some of those patterns are even visible when you look at the labyrinths, because all the labyrinths are based on a meander pattern. And when you walk the labyrinth, you're going in one, you're going clockwise, and then you go around a corner, and you go counterclockwise, and you go back and forth, clockwise, counterclockwise, left and right turns. It's a basic meander pattern, just like you find in rivers. And the same thing happens to flowing water, going through the meander, and the spiraling eddies, and all the various patterns in water. Those are credited with uh, filtering, uh, oxygenating, um, purifying, and recharging the water so that it's really living water. When we walk a labyrinth, we are being guided to dance in the same way that water dances flowing off the land in the streams. So as far as I'm concerned, when you walk a labyrinth, you are being taken through these extremely basic patterns that support life and so they vitalize you. But not only is that going on, you are being taught or shown what those patterns are. Not through your mind, but through the movement of your body. It's a kinesthetic experience. The reason that I brought sacred geometry to a labyrinth conference, which may seem like, what? <laughs> Why? Why? What's the, is there a connection here? Well, one of the easiest connections is that in order to see the patterns in the labyrinths, people have to learn how to recognize patterns. And in general, in our culture, that is not something that we learn. Our education system is not really based on recognizing relationships or on patterns. It's more on information and facts and figures, things like that. Um, there's a whole other world out there, a whole other way of looking at the world, which is looking at your hand or looking at a leaf and seeing, oh my goodness, this one is a six-pointed star, or this is hexagonal geometry, or, or this, the relationships in, in this is pentagonal. Or Most people uh, look at those things and never see any of that, and yet it's right there. The, the deeper goal beyond that is that then in that physical form are that you can see there are invisible geometries and geometrical relationships that created the physical form. So it's like I, my goal was to go backwards, one step at a time, into more and more subtle realms so that they could understand the foundation of the entire universe that we're living in, right from the Big Bang or the, the pure geometry creation of the universe right up to your own hand. One of the things that really fascinates me about sacred geometry is that as if you think of it as a language, it's a non-temporal language. It's a language that can never be lost because the language is a translation of the patterns and relationships and proportions in nature or in life, as I prefer to 
to say. Um, and nature and life are interchangeable to me. And nature means the essence of something. So the essence of anything, it turns out, is in the relationships. The relationships are a creation or a result of proportions. So it doesn't matter whether what it is that we're looking at. That is the most beautiful dragonfly I've ever seen. Red body, yellow wings, and its body is completely composed of golden mean relationships and nothing else. And each of these proportions, this in this case is golden mean relationships, each one of them has a meaning. And the meaning is not arbitrary. It comes from nature itself. It comes how that proportion functions in the body of the dragonfly or the human being or anything. You know, the golden mean is the principle of organic growth, and it guides the staged growth or the process of growth of any organism. And that's the meaning of the golden mean. And the way that it, the specific way that it guides the growth is that it allows each stage of growth to be related to the previous stage in the same way as that's related to the stage before that. So they're all related in the same way, and there's one symphony, and this is how geometry is used to give identity to something, and so you can remember who you are. Each of, and that's just the golden mean. So each of these proportions has a different meaning. It's not arbitrary. All you have to do is study the manifestations of that proportion in physical form, and you'll eventually come to what that proportion means. It's exactly the way that proportion is used in nature, and then we can translate that as a meaning. So the golden mean has a, one of the translations of what that means is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is how the golden mean is used in nature, to create one segment of growth that does to the next segment as that segment did to the original one. Do unto the other as you want it to do to the first one, to you. We can still rediscover what they were onto and what guided them just simply by looking at our own hands or by looking at trees or the patterns in water as it flows and makes eddies and whirlpools down the stream. It's all there in the world around us because that's where they found it. And all we have to do is to go back to their source, which is eternal and always there for us. It's always accessible. So the good news is it can never be lost. The bad news is the only way it can be rediscovered and found again or remembered is if your heart is open, you're in touch with your feelings, and you are aware of the world that you're looking at, not just looking at it, but actually seeing it. And so that's why I do geometry exercises. It's a way of reawakening your ability to see what you're looking at, to recognize patterns. The sphere is really the first thing that nature did. It's the easiest way to, uh, and most efficient way, to encompass space. The sphere encompasses, when you think of it as a bubble of air, like a soap bubble, it encompasses space using the least amount of material to do that. Okay. So it's very efficient. And I will use this term efficient or economical a lot because it turns out that that's what supports life, not wasting anything. <laughs> so atoms, uh, the whole universe, uh, the, this basic shape of the sphere of a ball, uh, is what nature would most like to do. It's the simplest way of doing everything. So molecules try to become spherical, um, etc. Another pattern has lots of different names. It's an explosion, like in fireworks, or uh, another word for it is radial patterns, which is what we'd call it when we see it in flowers, like dandelions. And of course, every time there's an explosion, like throwing a stone into a pond, there are ripples. So it's a part of that pattern. You could call it two different patterns, but they really, one is created by the other. So the concentric rings, or ripples. 
Next pattern, meander, we're all familiar with that one from uh, rivers and streams meandering. <clears throat> Branching, and we'll go into that more. We know mostly from trees. Alternation is a pattern I've added to the list that other people have made. And I find that one to be really important, and it, kind of, it shows up in many of these other patterns. Many of these overlap. But alternation is the basic idea of this and that, yes and no, on and off, yin and yang. And one and zero. One and zero, basic binary system, yes. And close packing, it's a, may at first sound like kind of a funny name, but what it means is that nature likes to take these spheres and when they are, need to cluster together to form molecules to get them as close together as possible. And so they, nature packs these together closely. And the honeycomb is a good example of that, where everything is packed together as close as possible, not wasting any uh, surface area, any materials to enclose those spaces. And the spiral and the helix, those two are often confused and um, when we talk, for instance, about spiral staircases, they are actually helical staircases. <laughs> so we'll go into the difference between these, but there's an image there to start with. So where are these patterns in the labyrinths? Are all those patterns found in labyrinths? <laughs> well, let's go exploring. You can see right away, uh, the, the meander is, is probably the first one that I saw. And these meanders turning back and forth through the labyrinths. It's actually what the labyrinths are all based on. It's one of the major pieces of it. So here we are with uh, a plan of it. And of course, it's all meanders, built out of meanders. But I just highlighted a few spots and the, to see them well. And in the medieval labyrinths, the, the meander is easiest to see where it's real tightly packed around the center. Looks very much like a snake meandering at that point. Very fascinating thing here of just extending that basic pattern around in a circle on one side, coming back to the center again and extending on the other side to show that you can go from meander to seven circuit labyrinth. Isn't that wonderful? So there is a mat meander in there that created that if you go back to the origin, one possible origin point for it. The meander we're most familiar with in streams and it, life uses the meander with the flow of water to moderate the speed of the water, to make it not too fast and not too slow. Because if it's too fast, it washes things away, you get a lot of erosion, you lose your soil, you can't grow any food because the soil's been taken away. If it's too slow, you can't drink the water. So you want water to be in between at a moderate rate of flow. And the meander slows down the water. When you drop, uh, you, you drop a drop of water into some still water, it creates uh, you know, first that explosion like the milk drop that we saw. And then, of course, some of the water, the drop moves down below the surface into the water and creates a little upside down mushroom cap. Uh, this is, and you can just barely see here, actually uh, right side up, okay? There's a little mushroom cap and these two little spirals just like an ionic uh, column on a Greek temple. Uh, and that expresses particular geometry. It's very precise. It's not arbitrary. The next thing that happens as the water moves down is that these little jellyfish-like threads are formed. And how many of them are there? Seven. <laughs> So, there, and this seven is one of the inherent numbers, part of the identity of water, flowing water and flowing air. Okay, so there are seven of these. If I take a picture across here, we get patterns like this, and we're approaching the mandalas that we're going to be drawing. And you can count this and see that there are seven of these little lobes. And here is the difference between living water and dead water <laughs> with chlorine in it and sewage and the kind of stuff we drink, it just has this ripples and, and no exquisite pattern of geometry in it. Okay. So the seven rings 
are, I think, very important. Um, it's why I'm concentrating on the Seventh Circuit Labyrinth, because of all these connections.